Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a Friday Reads type video. Uh, I am currently in the middle of Quit Like a Millionaire, No Gimmicks, Luck, or Trust Fund Required by Christy Shen and Bryce Leung. They are a Canadian couple who are kind of everywhere in the fire, financial independence, retire early talk because they retired at 31. And this is basically their guide on life planning for money first so that you can be entertained later as opposed to the kind of idea of chasing your passion first and then hopefully the money will follow. It's kind of interspersed with memoir bits about her family background and how she grew up in poverty and how that mindset impacted the way she approached uh, life choices. Like she talks about going into uh, studying computer engineering even though she wasn't necessarily good at it and didn't love it because that was going to have the biggest financial payoff quickly and then, you know, work for 10 years and retire so that you can write books and whatnot. If you have read any of that kind of fired stuff, this is not necessarily new. And frankly, if you've read any of that stuff, these people are probably mentioned in it, especially if you're in Canada. But it is a fun read in a way that I think a lot of personal finance isn't. It also skips over a lot of the basics, the kind of budgeting and the assumption that people are coming into things with debt, which I do think is a flaw of a lot of the kind of personal finance style of writing, because certainly that's a specific subset, but I think a lot of people are looking for other information, and this is the other information. And despite the fact that the authors are Canadian, a lot of the information in there is aimed at a US audience, and she talks about that as essentially writing is a passion project but this is still a book that i'm writing to make money and the u.s has this you know 10 times the population so obviously you want that information there so that they buy the book so i like that because at the one hand reading it as a canadian you do go well a lot of this is not really for us but at the same time they're very transparent about why that is and i appreciated that i've seen a lot of interviews with them so information wise it's not that interesting, but I do think this would be a great book to give to somebody in high school as they are thinking about their plans. I'm definitely buying that as a graduation gift, or not even a graduation gift. I do have some, you know, teenagers in my life who will be getting this as a gift soon, I think. I'm also in the middle of reading Tan France's memoir, Naturally Tan. If you follow me on Instagram, I talked about this recently. I started by listening to the audio of this because he does narrate it himself, and in general with celebrity memoirs, I like it when they are reading them themselves. But this is a memoir that is structured similarly to, oh, a couple of years ago I talked about how I had to DNF Sean T, the celebrity fitness trainer, his memoir, because it was such a weird mixture of his horrible childhood inspirational stuff and then like fitness tips. It was just really strange. This is not quite as back and forth as that one, but it does have enough of it that it was really distracting in the audio version. In the physical book, there are illustrations, which apparently were done by uh, Tan France's husband, that break it up so you don't jump from Here's a story about the amount of racism that his family faced growing up in the north of England in the 80s. And let's jump into, you should never wear those shoes. Shame on you. And it's weird. Like, I don't want to hear, my brother was almost the victim of a hate crime. And then we jump directly into, don't wear bootcut jeans. Which literally happens in this. And it's weird in the audio format. With the illustrations in between, if it's enough of a break that it's not as bizarre. Uh, there's a bit too much of, I don't know, everything plus the kitchen sink. I think it could have been a little bit better organized, but it is still fun. And uh, yeah, I'm reasonably entertained, which frankly, when you're reading a celebrity memoir, reasonably entertained is about as good as it's gonna get. I also read a collection of short stories and that was Salahatin Demirtesh's Dawn. I think I talked about this in a library hall at the back in December. This author is a politician in Turkey and he is a political prisoner right now and these are stories that he wrote from prison. Frankly I think they're kind of heavy-handed and I wasn't that thrilled. They're perfectly passable but it is definitely a case where I would rather read him talking about his own life than kind of heavy-handed metaphors involving birds uh, which is what this is. I also thought the translation, the translators, this was translated I think by two people, Amy Marie Spangler and Kate Ferguson. And I felt like it was translated to make things sound more 
foreign, if you will, than they needed to be. There were a number of places where I definitely felt the translator making a choice and it wasn't the choice that I, th and it was a choice that, it, you know, seemed to be a distancing tactic. And I wondered why they did that. And it felt kind of patronizing to have, for them to have made that particular translation choice. So this was okay. And I think the context is interesting, but the stories themselves, I didn't think were that great. And I think some of that was probably because I don't think the translation is unbiased, if that makes sense. So this was a bit disappointing. I also read Sachi Cool's collection of essays, One Day We'll All Be Dead and None of This Will Matter. She is a bit of a, I guess, media personality in Canada. She's gives commentary on television and her style is kind of always more chatty than deep, but she talks about topics that maybe deserve more depth. So I've always been kind of on the fence about that. This is pretty much an equal split of commentary and memoir pieces. And some of the memoir pieces are interesting, although they weren't always diving into the things that I necessarily would have been more interested in hearing more about. Like she has a really extensive section on her university partying experience. And I just didn't care about that. Uh, I was more curious about other things. She has, I did think she got into some interesting discussions that, that again is sort of danced around. She doesn't focus on that specifically, but she grew up in Southwest Calgary. And she does kind of address that because they lived in this particular part of the city, even though like there is a very large South Asian community in Calgary, because they lived in a different quadrant, uh, her experience of brownness and whiteness in Calgary was different than somebody who would have grown up in the Northwest, for example. I mean, I was particularly interested in that because I have lived in Calgary and my sister currently lives in Calgary. And population demographics are something that we've actually talked about lately because, you know, it's something that you take into consideration choosing schools because my nephew is currently in preschool and they're talking about, you know, where do you want to send your kids later because there are multiple options where my sister is living, incidentally in neither of those two quadrants, but uh, anyway. So it was interesting reading this kind of thing, but yeah, it, it is very in line with her kind of public persona. So if you enjoy the articles that she writes or her social media presence, you will probably enjoy this. If you're one of those people who, you know, sees her interviewed and says, she brings shame on journalism as a professional, you're not gonna be converted to being a fan of hers from this. Pretty much exactly what you'd expect. Um, I'm kind of, on neither side. I think sometimes she has interesting things to say, but I do think she doesn't particularly dig down as much as some journalists do or some commentators do. But so this was in line with what you'd expect from her. I also read two other memoirs, uh, one of which was Joshua M. Ferguson's Me, Myself and They, which I think the subheading is something like Beyond the Binary. I will insert the pic uh, the cover here. So Joshua Ferguson is a Canadian filmmaker who grew up in a few small towns and who a few years ago filed a claim with the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario to have a non-binary option added to birth certificates in the province. And so about a quarter of this memoir is specifically about that fight and a timeline of how that's gone, not just in Canada, but in other countries as well. Another significant portion of it is pure memoir. They talk about basically growing up and having at various points kind of been perceived as being either a trans woman or a gay man or something other than just outside of male or female and what that experience was like and also a lot of the kind of small town dynamics and whatnot. But there's another significant segment that is very, not quite manifesto-y, but kind of a lecture. On one hand, I think there are people who would need some of this explained just in terms of both terminology and other things. But so much of that is, this is what we want and speaks for kind of a whole of non-binary people or just people who don't identify with whatever their assigned at birth gender was. And I didn't buy into that and I thought that that was overstepping a little bit. There's another part where they mention that I've, you know, they've always felt very positive towards First Nations people because they lived close to these reserves. And I just thought, you cannot say things like that. I mean, some of the most offensive racism I've heard has been from people who lived near reserves but were of settler heritages, you know, saying I lived close to the reserve is not a way of saying, no, no, I, I have indigenous friends. Like, 
come on. So I wasn't a super fan of that, especially because there's a whole section about this is why pronouns are super important. And I mentioned this in a video a while ago, but the majority of human languages don't have gendered pronouns. So speaking in this universal way, when in lots of languages it's not such an issue. And I just thought that that was too much. Now, I'm just gonna say, to be fair, I saw Joshua Ferguson on a writer's panel last year, and they did a lot of kind of this kind of gesture as they spoke. And they were seated next to another author who's deaf. And I mean, politeness 101 is don't cover your mouth when you're talking and you're next to a deaf person. So that kind of turned me off. So I don't know if I'm reading this more harshly because I do think of them as the person who covered their mouth when they're talking in a situation where, you know, they shouldn't have been doing that. But now, I mean, to be fair, the panel, both an ASL interpreter and a uh, live captioning, but it still seemed really impolite. And especially because the panel that they were talking about, it was like a diversity focused panel. And I just thought, so because I had that kind of negative image in my mind, I don't know if I'm reading this more harshly than somebody else would. So your mileage may vary. I might have been nitpicking because I went in with a slightly negative attitude. In any case, it was interesting. I just didn't love the whole universal bit. All right, I also finally finished volume four of Riyad Satouf's The Arab of the Future. Uh, because I own it, it, I started it probably almost a year ago and, you know, just finally got around to reading this. I'm a huge fan of this series. I think it does a really good job of painting everyone in a really terrible way because that's just reality and people aren't great. This is a graphic memoir of the author's life growing up, primarily going between Syria and France. His father was Syrian and his mother was French and they lived also in Libya for a while and his father, it, during the period that this covers, was working in Saudi Arabia for a while. It does just a, a really solid job of portraying the problems that his parents have with each other, that they have with each other's cultures, in a way that really shows how everybody is wrong all the time, which is how a lot of these things work. There are points where he's talking about France with his Syrian cousins, or where he's talking about Syria with his French classmates, and he's misrepresenting both, essentially, because his experience of each is in this kind of village life because his parents were both from very small places. But that's true to how children are, that you don't have the bigger context when you're, you know, 10 or 12 years old. So he's telling people a lot of things that aren't true in a global, this is France, this is Syria way, but it's true to the villages, which is the only context he has for Frenchness or Syrianness at those points in his life. And I really liked that because I think that's something that, um, a lot of memoirs will try to iron out or point to some kind of blame on that. Yeah. So there's the art style. This is one, when it's pink, that means they're in Syria. When it's blue, that means they're in France. And when it's red, that means someone is very upset. Uh, so I really like the color coding in these. And yeah, if you haven't picked up the series, it's well worth getting into because I think it captures a lot of things really well. All right, I feel like I might be forgetting something, but if I am, I'll just save that for next time. If you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought of them. And yeah, that's it for now. Ciao. Yeah. <laughs> Scenic, there's that creek there and...